Thank you for listening to Nomad's Movie Reviews Podcast, available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Reddit, Instagram, and MeWe. And of course, be sure to visit mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. The whole operation hinges on you getting closer with him. I don't know you f***ing know this. Don't find yourself in terrain that you aren't familiar with. Hey, do you want me to teach you something that I learned at work? Close your eyes and you're going to breathe in. And when you breathe in, you're going to imagine that you're breathing in really clear air. And then when you breathe out, you breathe out all the black, dark, bad air. This is the largest missing persons case in the history of our state and is one of the largest in the history of our country. At the time, detectives found insufficient evidence for him to be considered a person of interest. The whole body's gonna relax. Your feet, your knees, your hips, your stomach. Just breathe in the clear air and out the blackness. Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 465. Releasing in Australian cinemas on October 6, followed by a global Netflix release on October 19, is The Stranger, a psychological crime thriller based on the true story of one of the largest investigations in undercover operations in Australia. Featuring terrific performances by Joel Edgerton and Sean Harris, The Stranger is an engrossing true crime thriller, rich in atmosphere and haunting in its depiction of violence as an uncompromising and insidious scourge upon all facets of society. And joining me now to talk about The Stranger is the film's director and writer, Thomas M. Wright. Thomas, I thank you so very much for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me, uh, Matt. Thanks a lot. It's great to have you back. Last time we spoke was back when Acute Miss Fortune came out. That was, of course, your first uh, directorial, you know, your directorial debut, your first film as a director, and to talk to you now, a couple of years later, I, find, I, I consider it to be such a blessing because I'm such a big fan uh, of your movies as both an actor and director, and, and you know, The Stranger really just confirms that for me. I watched it a couple of nights ago, and it's a film that's really stuck with me. Looking back, just about reading about the making of the film, it's really interesting how you were approached by producer Joel Edgerton to to you know, maybe write an adaptation of, of the book, The Sting, which was written by Kate um, Kiriakau, Kiriakau, excuse me. And that book, you know, very much, you know, you sat with it for a while. And I heard you say that this was a project that you find it kind of frightening to, to take on. And I just wanted to, to delve into that a little more. What was it about the story, um, about the uh, Daniel Malcolm's uh, killer, the, the, the Sting that really caught him, that really kind of, affected you in that way that you had some hesitation to kind of take it on as your as your next film project well that's a many layered it's a many layered question um and um I'll, I'll begin with what was really what i was really afraid of was the material itself um of dealing so directly with violence and the idea of violence against a child and mm-hmm. even for me saying that aloud i still i still feel that i struggle with that i still struggle with that idea um, because it it crosses some 
kind of unnameable barriers that are, that are there about um, the way that we feel about reality and our shared reality and, and about human nature also because violence against a child is inherently inexplicable, whatever the justification is. Um, and in Acute Misfortune, I think I'd, I'd, I'd made a film that was also in part about violence, but it was about it was a film about how we receive ideas about um, who we are and 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 how and how to be in in our society, um, and and a lot of that had to do with um, the kind of inherited ideas that are there for the artist Adam Cullen for that for that figure, and he painted an Australia of um, of um, violent unknowns and 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 a kind of unreconciled relationship with our with our past with our national character but he was an inherently quite a quite a quite an abusive individual certainly mm. within that relationship with the journalist Eric Jensen which is what acute misfortune deals with um but when Joel brought me this book when he brought me Kate's book the sting I just thought I can't face this I have a, I have a young child of my own I I just committed three years of my life or more, probably four years full time of my life to acute misfortune, which I really treated as a kind of forensic investigative project to unpack the lives of these two central characters and make a really complex kind of um, psychological portrait of both of them as as they were locked like two drowning swimmers in this um relationship it was a dark film but for me acute misfortune remains a kind of um black comedy that mm-hmm. that that turns into a tragedy where where i could really see no space for i i i just couldn't see any real space for um lightness and relief in this film there are moments of it there are flickers of it but when i read the material i was I was just afraid of the depth of violence and and my partner I spoke to my partner about it and she said I don't want you to do this this is um too much I know what it'll invite into our house and um and and I, and, I, and I don't I don't want I don't want this and a, an interesting thing happened as I started to sit with this material and look at it um because I was, it's also so complex. Joel had had this material, had had the the option on the book for for a couple of years, and I think he hadn't quite known how to proceed with it. And mm-hmm. it's because it is so dense structurally; it's so complex. And I don't think there's another Australian film quite like this in terms of the way that it's sort of structurally put together. It's formally quite quite radical and ex, and ex, and exciting on a sort of structural thriller. Um, level but i began to see a film in there that was not defined by violence at all obviously violence is the reason for this film and 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 a kind of unnameable act of violence is is at the center of it but really um it's a film defined by um the fact that the 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 violence can't be seen Mm -hmm. that you have a you have a someone go missing in the middle of it and what that suggested to me was that I needed to make a film about empathy, about who that person is for every single one of us that watches this film, um, and and a film that became about the connections between people, um, and about and about empathy, and about and about and about actually actually really at its core about the things we care most about in the world, um, and and that led to to casting my own son as Joel's son in the film writing that for him and not that that should be seen as the center of the film but it was an indication to all the people who worked with me on this film to say you i i'm calling on you to invest on to invest what why you want to make this movie why you want to tell the story because when these incidents of violence happen as they do continuously and insistently in human life um you know it confronts us with a kind of absence of meaning and violence threatens to strip meaning off things and render them meaningless. And I wanted to make a film about trying to make sense of reality, find the connection between people and find a form of resolution in the midst of all this darkness. So um, that, that, that's, that's really where the departure point began. But it was also it was a very steep learning curve because, you know, when I directed Acute Misfortune, I hadn't directed any film before. I hadn't directed short films, music videos, 
um, commercials, anything like that. And I still haven't done anything like that. I've just, I've, I've only written and directed two feature films, and it was an opportunity to reconcile some of the mistakes made on that film, um, and and to and to use use what I had um, learned. The films follow on from one another to a certain extent, but um, um, but The Stranger is is a very concentrated, um, very heightened version of that first film. I read, I, I heard you say once that that when it comes to committing to a project or a movie, it's almost kind of like falling in love with the story. And I imagine what you meant from that was almost kind of like almost from a passion perspective that you kind of you give yourself to the story and you try and you you put yourself, you know, uh, you commit yourself to the research and everything else. And for The Stranger, you had like six months of research of I've read right. that you put into this yeah, uh, film. Right. What the does that mean? Yeah, yeah, what does that consist of, though, that, that six months of research? When you say research, are you just looking at the case itself? Are you looking at other things for other movies, other um, psychological texts? What, what does that really consist of? No, this was this was pure applied research into um, material of this sort. So really it was like a, a, a full-time education in um, Australian policing, mm. um, undercover techniques, their legalities of that all the background information around this um, case, everything that I could um, access to give me a full picture of the reality of what a case like this would entail. Because, you know, it's also important to say that when I first read this material, I decided very early on that I was going to fictionalise this material, yep. that I was not going to represent any violence whatsoever. And, you know, people often talk about it as a, as a violent film, but actually it's striking in that there's not a single instance of violence in the entire movie of any sort. There's no representation of any victim, uh, let alone any violence being visited on them. All names and details were changed. There's no representation of the victim's family. It's a fictionalised retelling of an undercover police operation of the sort used in in that particular case. So in order to write this, I I didn't feel that there was any room for guesswork or um, half-sketched outlines that I was going to have to get right into the finest details of how these um, cases work. And I've said this before, but I'll never be able to talk about the way that research was conducted. Yeah, Um, I'll never be able to talk about um, who we who we spoke to, or what we had access to, or how that was how that was achieved. But I can say that people who are involved in these sorts of cases um, were were a, were a part of that process, have consulted and um, and have seen the finished film and can attest to the authenticity of the film. And I actually think I I hope that we were committed enough and serious enough in our pursuit of that. That, that people who do this sort of work will be able to um, see this film and feel that it's a very, very rare occasion where their work is actually represented authentically. Um, but, I, but I felt that there was, there was no other way to approach this film than to go into that depth of research. So I researched full-time for about, about 10 hours a day, six or seven days a week for six months. Um, and uh, at the end of that, I, I wrote the film. And it hit, it actually had such a tremendous effect on my body, such a such an appalling effect on my body that I was actually hospitalised after I finished the um, first draft. Mm. Uh, I, I came down with pneumonia and um, couldn't walk, <laughs> couldn't um, breathe, and um, and I think that has something to do with um, what it is to throw yourself into material in the way that I think a feature film really demands that if you're going to do any justice to the material that you're dealing with. Um, and and obviously that pales in comparison to the people that actually do this work on a day-to-day basis, let alone those who are directly Im- impacted by violence. Um, yes. It's, it's, it's uh, I'm sure, more than any of us would, would ever want to have in our lives. It's obviously, you know, uh, the, the, uh, it embodies a lot of people's deepest fears, and for some people, this this is their this is their day to day occupation. Um, and I really wanted to make a film that placed you um, subjectively in the experience of what it is to be that close to to that kind of capacity for for human violence, but also to do that in a way that was really gripping and thrilling and cinematic and immersive and gave audiences an experience that they could lean into and fall into and fall deeply and see something that they had never 
never seen before. Um, that part there where you said see something they have never seen before was really interesting is that I was listening back to our conversation in regards to acute misfortune and I asked about, you know, that film being a biopic, how you successfully kind of managed to avoid biopic tropes. Um, mm-hmm. And the same thing is done here in regards to The Stranger, in regards to the police procedural. You really yeah. do make a really good effort and successfully so in trying to sidestep in a lot of the tropey kind of stuff that could come with movies uh, like like The Stranger in regards to the whole kind of police investigation part. Are you very much aware of the tropes that come with a genre like that? And when you're writing your screenplay, putting together your ideas for the film, are you saying to yourself, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that in regards to that subgenre as a whole? I think films have to be thrilling and unique. And I think in order to justify existing as a film and the tremendous investment that they require, I think they should be things you can re- you can return to multiple times. And I think they should feel like something you've never seen before and an experience that you've never seen before. I'm aware of them to a certain extent. I'm not a I'm not a uh I'm not someone who watches police procedurals. I'm not really interested. I don't like the way that they um deal lightly with suffering as a as a form of entertainment mm. and I don't think this film is 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 guilty of that. I think this film is a really serious attempt to to um to to name and understand something that um most of us thankfully will never have to confront. Um, in in our lives, but I was aware that it demanded a different form. And when I think about m- my work, I'm constantly thinking in terms of form and content, and trying to create something that feels three dimensional, almost sculptural, that you can place somewhere, turn it, look at it in the light, look at it over time, and it will change, but it'll retain its quality. You know, depending on where you're at in your in your life and where your where your concerns are. Um, but that it has a really rigorous formal relationship to the to the material in the story, to to what it's telling, and so I wanted to make a really kind of thoroughbred psychological thriller in in some ways because I felt that was what it demanded, and obviously there's a very long history of those sorts of films, and um, the influences were really quite disparate, and I'm and I'm probably not interested to talk directly about what those what those influences were but mm. on the one hand you have a highly structural thriller a film with so much material to deal with that by the end of our first act we've dealt with as much narrative as most australian feature films and then the film continues to unpack itself in this kind of five act structure with parallel narratives that are revealed to be parallel timelines complex uh, intersections of of uh, character and plot and then on the other hand, you have a very densely layered psychological portrait of two central characters in the film um, and connecting it, connecting those two really distinct narrative forms is a forensic filmic language that belongs more in um, the terrain of documentary Mm. Um, and, and I love documentary cinema, and I love being given the eyes of um, in, in investigators and um, and being made being made active in the story of the film, so that I am having to put these things together. But for people who really engage with this film, and not everyone's going to engage in the film, it also uses that language to make you lean into and try to unpick the. Um, the structural part of the film, but also the psychological part of the film. So you're being made, you're being made a, a you're giving a forensic perspective on on what's a kind of unusual structure. I, I wasn't consciously trying to do something different. It's just that the the material insisted on a form. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I had to, in order to appreciate what those police actually achieved and the psychological sophistication in an operation like that, you you had to place an audience in the shoes of someone who was the target of an operation like that. Then in order to tell other um, parts of the story, you needed to establish um, the building of the relationship, which is the substance of the, uh, the, the, the dramatic core of the film, and the getting of information um, on the on the other hand, um, 
So without without giving away any more um, uh, about the film, that's that's what led to that. Um, that's what led to that to that structure. Do you want to surprise people? You want people to be surprised, yeah. And in a film like this, you wanted them to have their 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 heart in their mouths, so so to speak. You know, it's a film that insists itself bodily on the on the audience. You know, there's that idea of breath that's returned to throughout the film, and that's. That's one of the ways the film tries to to make the film a physical experience for viewers. The Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is brought to you by Tee Public. Tee Public is the world's largest marketplace for independent creators to sell their work on the highest quality merchandise. With over 1.2 million designs, Tee Public is sure to have something you will love. The Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is brought to you by Amazon, the world's leading online store. Amazon is your first stop to buy a wide range of products at competitive prices with fast delivery times. Amazon is also a world-class entertainment hub that includes Prime Video, Audible, Twitch, Amazon Music, and more. Sign up with Amazon today and experience the best in online shopping and entertainment. I'm curious in regards to your backgrounds and talent as an actor whether you saw any type of through lines in regards to undercover police work in regards to acting as a skill. There's, um, there's this is um, th- that great Tarantino film, Reservoir Dogs, and, of course, that has to do with uh, undercover police officer as well. There's a monologue in the film where a, um, um, an undercover cop has a mentor and the mentor says to him, you know, to take on the role, you have to be like Brando. You know, you have to lift the role. And it's really interesting, like, when I was thinking about that when watching this movie, it seemed like... Joel Edgerton's character was kind of like, of course, he has to play the role of of this kind of like this criminal who has to befriend Sean Harris's character. And a lot of times it really kind of felt like tightrope theatre, but the stakes are very, very real. Yourself as an an actor, do you see kind of like how undercover um, police officers, do they look at acting as a craft and kind of use that kind of stuff to to do their job to make sure they can put up on that convincing air or does that not even come into the, the conversation oh, I would say that's a um that's a pretty that has more that comment from in Reservoir Dogs probably has more to do with Tarantino's interest in cinema than it does with the subject that he's actually dealing with hmm. yeah um I don't think undercover cops give a fuck about Marlon Brando um, I certainly don't think they're thinking about what would you know what would Brando do in this scene? How would someone embody and approach this? For a start, they're they're not dealing with, for the majority of the time, they're not dealing with scripts. And I would actually say they're they're often people whose um, psychology doesn't necessarily lend itself to an extraordinarily developed idea of character. Mm. And the discomforting thing for them is that they're having to use their own lives to create. Um, these relationships with with people and entering into you know uh, situations where they're in great physical peril, and um, that they are under resourced, they are they are under equipped, they are not psychologically prepared. Their the methods are, are primitive and unexacting, and this is not to take anything away from how extraordinary. Um, their work is, but it has to do with just how um, alone and exposed. Um, they can um, they can be left in the midst of these sorts of operations, and whether or not they have any way to um, reconcile that work with their own life, or indeed return to their own life afterwards, is probably um, a question that sits somewhere in the in the background of this film. Because you know, I mean, the thing the thing about the entire undercover genre of story as far as I appreciate it and everything that I've ever seen is that you have an individual in a situation of psychological, personal risk um, because they are alone mm. in a, in a, in an, in an organization, which if it found out who they really were would, you know, harm them or, um, you know, what have you at the very least, the, the operation would end um, and, and they wouldn't be able to secure a conviction in, in this instance, at the height of this operation, there were uh, there were in the vicinity of fifty undercover operatives, all at work to target one individual, and the threat from that individual is less physical than it is psychological, mm. um, because 
you are in a place of great unknowns. Um, you're you're in a place of of uh, you don't you don't know what this person is 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 guilty of. You are trying to accumulate evidence, but you're dealing with an intelligent, um, cunning individual who's practiced at concealment. And the whole idea of this film was about a, a central relationship based entirely on lies. I talked about acute misfortune. I think I would have spoken about it when we when we last talked as a relationship based on theft. Mm. Um, two people in a kind of, you know, it, the worst version of it, and this is not entirely true of the reality, but it's a dramatic provocation. It's a it's a mutually kind of parasitic relationship um, where they're t- they're taking from one another all the time, and um, and then here you have in a relationship where they're not even dealing with a real person. Both of them are dealing with a mask and the reality of who they are, why, why they're there and what they're after is, is all buried. And really it's about that performance of the self and the performance of this, um, of this relationship because what these cops are doing is they are effectively making a film. The Stranger is a film within a film. Hmm. It's it's about the the writing of, the conceiving of, the casting, the locations, and the audiovisual recording of a narrative in order to secure information against this um against this person. Um, and and yeah, as as you pointed out, the toll that it takes on on people at the center at at, at the center of that. And you know, like one of the one of the dramatic devices of the film is the fact that uh, the reminder subtly, generally, um, that you're not dealing with actors, and that this entire thing is is held together with with um, the thinnest of fibers, and yep. it, and it could and it could collapse at any at any time. What's interesting to me in regards to Joel Edgerton's character that a lot of his anxieties and his fears are brought up in dreams. And um, I'm so fascinated in regards to how filmmakers approach dreams in their stories. When it came to yourself, um, when did the idea came to kind of like have dreams be such a, a, a big part of this character's kind of like inner t- turmoil? Very, very early, um, really early, you know, before I put pen to paper. Um, as I was structuring the film, I became aware of the idea that, um, you know, as I said, the threat in this film is psychological. Um, and um, we needed to to go deep inside the psyche of our central character um, and a way to unpack his fears and the way that this relationship was making its effects felt on him was to go inside his mind, inside his subconscious and um and into his and into his dreams. Um, and I think it's a tremendous, language of cinema um in many ways film is a language of dreams um there's you know it's it's a it's a it's a language of of symbols of of visual metaphors it's a language of um resonances and associations with the things that are presented to you and I think it's one of the reasons that I've always found film tremendously comforting is that it's like a an in, it's like a an internal language, mm. um, you know. Uh, and that's the that's the, the the types of films that I've responded to most in my life have a have a dreamlike um, uh, quality and an uncanny quality. And uh, that was definitely something that I felt had been missing from. Um, from films like this, and a and a missed and a missed opportunity to really excavate the the inside of a of a character and to blur the line between between dream and reality. And you know, that's those sorts of those sorts of choices and those sorts of ideas are layered everywhere throughout the film. Because again, everything comes back to that central relationship. And in that central relationship, you have one character who's living a dream and the other who's living a nightmare. Mm. That's a really really good point there. I want to talk about. Um, and this will be my, my final question here, just in regards to the post-production process of this film, like we've um, Acute Misfortune, I, I read that you said about with that film, that was such a, a fresh experience for you as a director um, that you realised at the end of that film how much an edit uh, defines the making of a film. And now you go into this movie with that knowledge. Um, how much do you put into 
your post-production processes early on in the film, especially in regards to something like sound design, which is so beneficial for this film, because of course we're talking about an undercover operation with recording equipment, et cetera, all that kind of stuff. How many conversations do you have with, with um, Andy Wright, the um, film supervisor yeah. and sound editor, in regards to that part of, of the film? Well, they were, they were lengthy discussions. It's a really it's a really interesting question, but not only with him, it was also with Matthias Shakarnet, who provided that strange percussive sound mm. um, that features in in the film, and also Oliver Coates, who who wrote the score. Um, all of them were involved beforehand. Um, you know, I'm a filmmaker who's really invested in the idea of pre-production. This was a very long pre-production and many of the pre-production elements I'm beginning while I'm writing the script and I'm talking to my key collaborators about certain aspects, things that I need them to begin thinking about or sourcing um, as, as we're building it so that it grows really organically within this within this group of people that are going to be making the film. But one of the key things was that sound that begins the film and punctuates it in in time. That kind of yeah sound, which is actually a machine, um, a percussion machine built by a by an experimental percussionist from Melbourne called Matthias Shakarnet, um, who incidentally had actually worked with the composer Oliver Coates in New York on a project with Iggy Pop about a year before this. Um, before this uh, film um, began, but also talking with Ollie about this, and Ollie has been involved with some of the great scores of the last 15 years. He's a central collaborator for Johnny Greenwood and for, for Mika Levi, and his work on Under the Skin is uh, all the instrumentation that features in that score, which is, I think, one of the great um, one of the great scores of of, of this century so far. Um, and I, um, one of the ways, to, probably the best way to talk about the sound is at one point in time, it ties in with the whole methodology on the making of the film. We went to the underpass location, a really central location um, on the film for the first time at, at night on a location scout. And it was completely pitch black. And producers, um, Sam, the director of photography, it, Everybody became extraordinarily concerned because we said we can't we can't film here. This is it's too dark. It's unusable, and um, it's going to require too much infrastructure. And I said, everybody, just be quiet and listen. And we were underneath this underpass, so there would be the silence interrupted by this as the cars would pass overhead. And I said, for a start, that's that's how we know where we are, and. And as we were talking and as I, we were standing there and listening, this car came over the horizon on the rise, um, the road underneath the underpass, and its headlights passed through the underpass and illuminated it. And the lights went over the, uh, the, the grills, the concrete grills underneath the underpass, and visually it went like this. And I knew that that sound that Matthias had created was going to be central to this. The sound of those cars was going to be central to this. It sounded like breath. It sounded like a wave. It sounded like a pure psychological metaphor for what the film was um, dealing with. I recorded that sound on my phone. I sent it to Andy Wright, the sound of the cars overhead. Um, I'd already been in discussion with Matthias about the this, this work that he had created and these sounds that he was creating. I sent it to Andy and I sent it to Oliver and Oliver was in England working out of his studio or maybe he was in Scotland working out of his studio in Glasgow at the time and he sent back a piece of music inspired by the sound of those cars passing overhead which actually became the last piece of music in the film that carries us through the last um, 10 to 15 minutes um, of, the, um, of the film. Um, and when it comes to something like sound, I think what you're looking for is an extraordinarily pure and concentrated idea around which you can anchor the film. You, you do the same thing with every department. All of them will be distinct, but they should come together to form a piece because as a director, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to unify and create an alignment between all of these disparate elements that could come together and feel completely dissonant. And maybe you want them to feel dissonant, but how do you want them to feel because ultimately it's going to come down to feeling 
and a very strong, um, you know, it has to have a strong thought basis, a strong conceptual idea. As I said before, this idea of form and content, but at the end of it all, it's it's about feeling and the depth of feeling that you get from um, from those elements. Well, it's such a fascinating facet to a movie that I just thought was incredibly engrossing, incredibly just really absorbed me all the way through. And for everyone listening, October 6th in the Select the Strange Cinemas and then followed by a global release on Netflix October 19, The Stranger, starring Sean Harris and Joel Edgerton and directed by Thomas M. Wright, who I'm just speaking to right now. Um, it's a fantastic film. It really is, Thomas. And it's so great to, to talk to you again a few years after Acute Misfortune and to see this film as well. Just I think it's just, like I said, really fantastic. And I love the fact that, you know, we talked off air before about how many films I watch, you know, per week and how many list of films I go through. It's great to watch a movie like The Stranger that can really take me for a ride that's different to everything else I've seen beforehand. And I think that's really a a, a kudos to you in regards to that and, and to your actors and to your your uh, crew cast and crew as well it's a fantastic film i can't wait for people to watch it and so cool as well by the way that it's getting a cinema release in australia because this is a film that needs to be seen on the big screen as well and um congratulations to you best of luck with the film's release and i hope when it comes to that other film in a few years time we can talk again sir oh very much look forward to talking to you then thanks Matt. thank you for watching the matt's movie reviews channel please subscribe for more reviews podcast interviews and exclusive content. Also, if you would like to request a review and support my work, please join my Patreon via the link in the description below.